In my video about the basics of pitch design, I said there are generally three forces in play. Gravity, drag, and the Magnus effect. But there's actually one more. It's called seam shifted wake. The idea is that the seams on a baseball cause the air flowing around it to act weird sometimes. When it's in the right orientation, the flow around the ball can actually be unbalanced. And when it's unbalanced, it makes the ball move. Now, the majority of the time since the ball is spinning too quickly, this cancels out with itself and you don't actually see the ball move because of it. But on some pitches like the knuckleball, the spin rate is low enough, you have enough time to see the, these imbalances and the ball will move in peculiar ways. But then again, they're random. And that's the downside of the knuckleball. The effect is random so you can't really control it that well. But some recent research shows there may be players in the MLB right now that use this effect systematically to make the ball move in one direction. For example, Trevor Bauer's two seam uses the effect to move horizontally, and Steven Strasburg's changeup uses the effect to move vertically. But the pitches they're throwing are still spinning a lot. How are they getting the effect from a knuckleball to a pitch that spins a lot without it canceling itself out? It's because they're aligning the ball and their spin, so as it's spinning very rapidly, a pattern in the seam persists to make the ball move, despite the revolutions. One such pattern has been theorized and tested by a group on BaseballAerodynamics.com. They wrote a great article, which I'll have the link to in the description, about a pitch they call the looper. The idea of the pitch is that with the right orientation and spin efficiency, a pattern will form where around one pole will be a bunch of seams clustered, and the other pole will have near none around the pole. Without going too deep into the fluid dynamics of it, this imbalance causes the ball to move away from the cluster without interfering with the Magnus effect. So, being in quarantine, I figured why not learn the pitch and show what that development process looks like. Let's go! When I'm in a usual pitch design session, I'm just trying to maximize efficiency. So I'll be using this ball, and to gauge whether it's efficient enough or not, I'll be watching it in slow motion, and if I can see either pole of rotation, then I could be doing better. However, in this case, I need to be a bit more specific because I need this pitch to be efficient and for the axis to be on the exact point I want to be. So I designed this ball that marks where this axis of rotations need to be. So now when I'm reviewing it, rather than just trying to see flashing black and white, I'm trying to see something like this, where these two sides are both black and the circles here are staying stable from the perspective of the camera. So I'm going to be setting up my camera and seeing what I can do to both stay efficient, but also stay on the right axis. So let's see what we got in terms of the pitch by pitch. So looking at the first one, I think I was doing somewhat of a warm up. You can see the circle on the left kind of wobbling, and then also, since the circles were kind of turned like this, you can tell that that pitch was too inefficient for the pitch uh, for the effect to actually be observed. So that was too inefficient, and it didn't look like it was on the right axis. This was another, I was gripping it like a regular four-seam fastball and just letting it fly. Again, it looks like I'm cutting it too much, where, you know, the, the axis Rather than rotating straight like this, it's rotating like that if you're from home plate's perspective. So I really got to figure out what I'm doing in terms of actually getting efficient first. And then I'll have to figure out how to get on the right axis afterwards. So again, four seam fastball grip. Cut again. Yeah. So you can, t like, you can just tell it's cut because I can see the circle on the left side of the ball from the perspective of the camera, but you can't see any of the right circle. So you can see that imbalance in that sense. And that's usually what I'm going to be uh, fighting. I'm usually not going to be releasing it like this. And you're going to be accidentally cutting it like that. So then here you can see I was, I'm going to switch grips for one that has a wider spread between these fingers because I had this weird, I was doing some weird tests and I found that when I gripped it that particular way, it had a more vertical spin and it was having a lot of efficient spin, so I don't know, hopefully this puts it on the right axis.
it's better, but it's still cut. Let's see, second pitch with that same grip. Yeah, that's really bad. Cut again. So I'm gonna try to align the, my release point and the uh, target better with my camera. But at the same time, my problem right now is just that I'm cutting. I mean, it's, it's not even worth pursuing the right axis because I'm just cutting it too much. So we'll have to, we'll have to see what I can do about that. Uh, between my regular four seam grip and that weird kind of, I don't know, still four seam, it not really, it's kind of a cut grip. But between the two grips, I'm leaning towards the second one. However, both performed so poorly, I, I don't really think there's any point differentiating for now. I'm gonna keep bringing the, both of them into round two of testing. So I'll start by saying the first throw was very bad. But also this round, I tried staying off the seam for my four seam grip, my regular four seam grip. I just didn't want the seams trying to like uh, make me manipulate my wrist position. But with the, uh, I don't know, we'll just call it the split cut grip, I guess. That's a terrible name. But with the split cut grip thing, I did stay on a seam, but I tr tried to choose one that was pretty flat. So again, it wouldn't naturally try to make me cut or anything. So here's the first terrible throw. Not wobbling that much. So it's on, it's on the right, it, it's axis is on the right part of the ball. So it's got the right orientation. I'm not sure if it's got the right efficiency because the ball wasn't that lined up with the trajectory. So I don't quite know on that. So actually real quick, just rewinding here for a second. You look at my grip right here. I'm taking, I'm taking this baseball and again, I'm going off scene but I'm putting my fingers on the edge of the white and the black, you know, so it's giving me a more spread out grip. Hopefully that reduces my natural uh, want to cut it, but it also keeps it balanced. So I wouldn't have the black and white lines in a game, but if that grip works, I can train myself to try to replicate that grip. Uh, let's see here, this one. Let's see if you zoom in. Unfortunately, again, the camera's not perfectly lined up with the tra trajectory here. But that looks good. That looks pretty good. Now, here's what I'm seeing here. There's not that much wobble on it. And since the camera, if the camera's trajectory is like this, then the ball's trajectory is like this, right? you naturally expect to see the left pole of the ball if it's spinning efficiently, which you do here. You see the left pole predominantly, but since it's lined up wrong, but you still see that right side, it's a tight circle, that's, that's close to what I'm going for. That, I'd be okay with that as a, as a consistent result. So let's see what we got with the next one. Another, another spread forcing grip. You look at that, that, that's what we're going for. I mean, look at this. So again, here's what I'm seeing. The ball is wobbling, but it's staying, it's right there. It is right there. I can't quite tell what part around here specifically the axis is on. But that The fact that it's wobbling very little is a very good sign. And then also, again, look, you can see a bit of that, uh, you can see the right, a bit of the right circle. Despite, again, the trajectory, the tra trajectory is pretty good. So it looks like I might've cut this ball just the slightest bit. It might've been off from the axis I'm aiming for just the slightest bit, but that's two very good results now from this grip where I go my four seam grip and I balance my fingers between the black and the white. So two very promising results in a row from that. Did I switch grips yet? No. Again, I'm sticking to the black and white, getting one more throw in because the first one was terrible. I generally like three. It's a nice sample size. Again, look at this. 
the tight wobble. I'm trying to figure out where the axis specifically is. So it looks like if I, if this were kind of my target, it's a bullseye. It looks like the axis would be right about here. So uh, when you come over here, that's not that probably won't get me the uh, the movement from the effect. But again, that's three very promising results from saying off scene with this kind of it's just this weird ball orientation four scene grip. The spread fingers to uh, increase efficiency and let's see a slight bit of cut it's hard to say it's hard to say exactly how much that's good that's good that's what I'm going for right there so now let's take a look at how the split cut grip how that did so when I was getting this grip I was particularly trying to I was trying to like spread my ring finger off and then keep these two fingers tight. So it keeps, it, it gets this weird tension between these two. I've heard it described before, uh, you can get curveball pressure like that between these two fingers, but I was kind of going with that with for a fastball. We'll see how, we'll see how that works out, but I had good results in the past with it. I'm just hoping that since it's a cutter like grip, yeah, no. So it looks like the trajectory of the camera going straight out was pre-aligned with the actual ball's trajectory there. And as you can see, you can only see the left, you can only see the left black circle. So it seems like that, that grip is more consistently cutting it. It's getting a wider wobble. I can't quite tell where. It looks like it's more in this, this outer black territory. So that's one, that's the first pitch I threw with that grip. Second. So I threw it a bit to the left. Look at that. You know, that's actually approaching a slider spin. So that was somewhere out here in terms of the spin axis. So we're missing by a pretty good amount of degrees. Another wide wobble. Looks like I'm consistently out here now. So at this point, Granted, we're still dealing with a small sample size here, but it does seem like this, uh, the four seam grip is the way to go because it's consistently giving me more efficiency, which is a plus, and it's getting me closer to the axis I'm aiming for. It, I can't quite tell since I don't really have 60 feet or uh, a good objective way of measuring exactly how much the ball is moving, uh, whether, the, whether the effect is actually coming to fruition, but it does seem like out of the two grips that I'd be trying right now, the this four seam grip a bit more spread out with the fingers and staying off seam, that seems like what I'm gonna be going with these next few rounds. So I'm gonna scrap the split cut weird grip. Round three of testing and we're going all wide no seam grips. Let's get going. <laughs> that is so good. That is, oh man, I've never done axis training before. Oh, that is so cool. So again, the trajectory is a bit off, not what I prefer, but look at this. Look how tight that circle is. Perfect. Well, I mean, it's not perfect, perfect, but the point is that means in this mini, this mini black circle, the axis is probably within there. So I only missed by a few degrees, which means I probably captured the effect in that pitch. Uh, it, again, it's, it's a bit hard to gauge exactly the spin efficiency since the trajectory is a bit off, but it looks good. It looks good. If that's, if that's near, if that's near hundred percent efficiency that pitch is gonna have the looper effect. So, very promising results. Let's go to pitch two. I'm trying to line up my release point. Ooh. Bit more wobble. The axis is lined up pretty well. You can see a, 
I'd say about that much tilt. So, from your perspective, that's that's not too bad, I guess, in terms of the act, uh, the inefficiency observed. But there's a bit more wobble than I'd like. It looks like I got it around this part in terms. Of, so I missed by. I'm not good at estimating degrees. A 10, 10 degrees, 10, 15. Yeah, we'll go around there. So this was this was maybe like shallow second black stripe. Again, a bit of wobble. I'd say that's between the white ring and the second black ring in terms of how much I missed the axis by. I think I can even see what part of the axis I missed. Again, it looks like I'm cutting it just the slightest bit. The trajectories are a bit off. That would have been that would have been lined up if I'd hit my target, but I ripped it just a little bit. I'm kind of just checking these. Make sure they're game speed. Throw one more. Oh, I'm about to slow that one down. One second. Again, a bit of wobble, maybe out here. So right now, let's see, that round I went one for four. Uh, I think last round, I'll be a bit generous and give myself one for three. And remember, the benefit of this pitch is that to observe the effect, you have to be throwing at, a, at or near 100% efficiency. And the beauty of that is that basically means you can just take your usual four seam grip, turn it into this, and sure, maybe the 80% of the time that you don't see it, it's just your usual fastball. But then, whether that's the one out of three or one out of four or even less, every now and then, if this if you line this pitch up right, it will it will have this odd movement that the batter will not expect. And honestly, it'll, it'll be this type of movement. It's not just the regular Magnus effect. It takes it takes effect at a very specific point. So it literally will be late break. So that's the benefit. It's that I may be missing this currently two out of three, three out of four, but it's worth it. Because it ultimately, as long as I'm not losing too much velocity by splitting my fingers just a bit, it's worth it. So I'm gonna keep giving this a few more shots, see if I can get the consistency up a little bit. But that's how these programs go. I'm testing different grips to see which work for best for me. And ultimately, I'm slowly working towards finding this better axis. And once I kind of find out a pattern of what works, you know, maybe I test around a bit with thumb position on this. Maybe I toss, uh, test around a bit where the no, amongst no seam positions, where is the best part for me to grip? And then ultimately, I keep pushing for more consistent ap axis replication and whatever I can do to get this effect to occur more times. And hopefully, quarantine will end somewhat soon so I can actually go outside and throw this and ask people if they are seeing uh, these results because they should be observable. They, they should move three to four inches more than a usual ball would and hopefully those three to four inches would be somewhat spectac in spectacular fashion. So I will see where we go but if this is the end of the video, thank you for watching.